So today I'm going to talk about kernel bypass networking. And just to give you some context, um, I work for a company called Exablaze. We make some network cards um, and some switches as well. Um, I'm not here to sell you on our stuff, but just to give you some context of what we do. Um, basically, all our stuff is designed for low latency. And what we mean in this context by low latency is the time from something going in to something going out. Um, in this case, it's usually measured from either from application to wire from app to application, if you're talking about something like a scientific computing context, where you've got an application on one node, application on another node, another physical computer, and you're interested in getting data from one to the other as quickly as possible. So then the latency is from application to application. Um, the other way of looking at it is from wire to application to wire when you've got a server and you want the server to respond as quickly as possible. So you're looking at a packet coming in, the server responds to it, sends out a packet, and you're interested in the latency from the packet going in on the wire to the packet going out on the wire. Actually, both of these give you the same number, usually, because the first one's one transmit and one receive, and the other one is one receive and one transmit. It's just a different way of, of looking at the thing. So. Who cares? Um, so firstly, scientific computing type applications. Sometimes you have uh, cer certain scientific applications that uh, are latency bound. So you don't have enough computing work between network communication to hide the latency. And so it becomes network bound and latency makes a difference. Uh, a big one that a lot of our clients are interested in is, is financial trading. Um, in, in this sort of problem, we've got some input coming into our system, which might be uh, market data, and then the trading system does some calculations and sends a packet out to, to send an order to the exchange. And in this case, people are interested in minimizing the latency between get, getting that market data into their algorithm and being able to send something out. Um, and so, you know, without going into the, uh, you know, wh whether we think financial uh, high-frequency traders are, are evil um, or whatever, like this is this is a very big application, and we we like these people because they're early adopters. They, you know, if if the technology is there, if you build it, they'll come and they'll use it. So, um, so so they're they're a big driver of this sort of technology, and. I think, you know, I'm not going to comment too much, I guess, on the, on the ethics, but I think in the, in, the, in the olden days, it was the person who would get their order in first was the, the tallest and the loudest on the trading floor, whereas now, you know, you really need the best technology. So it's sort of um, the, the trading has become more about geeks and uh, less about big personalities on the trading floor, and, you know, as a geek, I like that. So, um, so I... It is what it is. Other applications of low latency, storage. Um, often, like, if, you, if you've got data in memory, accessing it is fast. If you've got data uh, on disk, accessing it is slow. If you've got a network that's fast, you can access data from remote nodes in, in a time that's somewhere between those two. So, so latency can be important for storage. Um, and also for distributed databases because of locking issues. Um, in order to lock stuff, you need to communicate between nodes, so latency can be important there. Fundamentally, the total time for anything is going to be a sum of latencies. So in a sense, everyone cares about latency, um, but some, some of those latencies may be more hidden than others in a system. So sometimes you can, you've got enough work that you can hide the latencies. Sometimes your latencies add up. Uh, so that's sort of a bit of motivation about why we care about network latency, how fast we can move data between nodes. Some of the key vendors, um, and this is non-exclusive, but these, these are sort of in the space that we work in, these are the, the vendors that we butt up against um, as vendors who specifically sell their stuff as low latency. So, so there's the Mellanox, which is, which is quite big in, um, Mellanox is quite big in the um, scientific computing space, um, SolarFlare, 
does a lot of uh, low latency stuff, especially for trading, Exablaze is us, um, Chelsea and uh, Miracom. Miracom was, of course, one of the early companies to get into um, low latency networking um, for the scientific space. They're, they're a bit less prevalent now, but uh, still, they still exist. They're owned by CSPI now. So all of these vendors have kernel bypass solutions, and I'll talk a little bit about the various uh, solutions in a moment. Uh, first, I want to talk about why, why we need to do kernel bypass or why we want to do kernel bypass. Um, if we just run our application on, on Linux, the sort of latencies we might get from application to application, and this will, this will vary a lot depending on um, lots of things, your system and, and your kernel config and all sorts of stuff, but um, just running a random uh, benchmark on, on our system, um, these days we get about six, six microseconds end-to-end. -end. The underlying hardware latency here is about 0.8, so 800 nanoseconds to get that data from the cache line on one, uh, on one computer to out the network card uh, in, in another network card through the PCI up, up to a cache line on the other system. Um, sort of best of breed hardware is about 800 nanos, um, 700 to 800. My, most, so most of that network latency between 0.8 and the 6 that the, the user might see uh, is in software. And of course, we could optimize that a bit. We could, we could probably shave off another couple. But it's even better if we can avoid going through the kernel at all. So that's really what we're looking at doing here. Um, and here I'm focused on latency, but lower latencies also improve bandwidth. Because if you just remove the amount of code that um, that's in the path that you need to go through, then you can get more done as well. So one of the solutions that's used a lot in this space, which, which some people um, may or may not be familiar with, is this idea of transparent kernel bypass, where you have an existing sockets application, uh, and you basically LD preload an acceleration library underneath it. Uh, I've called this a neat solution slash hack. Uh, obviously, LD preloading under libc is, is a hack, um, but it works quite well. So the idea is to intercept all the socket-related libc calls, and of course, um, because some things like read and write and, um, and signal handling and stuff like that are some, somewhat uh, interdependent on this stuff, you actually need to uh, hook more than just the sock calls, but there's, there's a subset of libc calls that you can hook. And basically each one, you add code to determine if the pass file descriptor is a socket that should be accelerated, and if it is, then instead of passing that through to a kernel syscall, you pass it to your user space TCP IP stack in your library. So that, that's, the, that's the first thing, you have an acceleration library that has a, a user space TCP IP stack in it. Secondly, we need to actually map the network card to user space. Um, so this is, this is simplest if the network card is designed with this sort of usage in mind. These days it's more common because uh, they're designed for things like um, SRIOV, the uh, IO virtualization. So often network cards have this sort of functionality where they can export multiple virtual interfaces. So rather than having to map the whole network card into a user process, you can just map um, a virtual interface of it into a user process. Um, so, so obviously, so we, we've got this library that does the user space TCP IP stack. We've, we've mapped at least some of the network card into it so we can send and receive packets directly. And then the third bit that makes this transparent, which a lot of people overlook, is that we pull the interface and route configuration from the kernel. So what that, what that means is that basically that same, that same interface, you can either run your program without the LD preload library, in which case all the calls go through the kernel and the networking works, um, or you run it with the LD preload library. And because the interface configuration is all the same within that user space stack, it just works transparently and hopefully you get better latency than going through the kernel. So all of the vendors that I've 
that I mentioned before have these sort of transparent stacks that are LD preloaded. Um, Mellanox has one called VMA. Solarflare has one called Open Onload. We have one called Exasoc. Chelsea has one called Wire Direct, and Muricom has one called DBL. Uh, so, so Wire Direct and DBL are proprietary. Um, the, the other three are various degrees of open source. Um, Mellanox, in the last couple of years, has has opened up VMA, which um, which is really nice. They've got a dual GPL BSD license on that now. Um, open Onload has an interesting combination of GPL and EULA. Um, how does that work? You say, well, they, well, they do explain in their, their license that the GPL covers your copying and modification, but if you actually want to use it, well, we've got a bunch of patents on it, so, um, so you need to agree to some extra conditions. And even if you agree to those conditions, they don't actually explicitly grant you a patent license, so um, there, there's a few warts there that we're, that we're a bit uncomfortable with. Um, so, so um, I'll talk a little bit in a moment, um, but I mean, the reason why we developed Exasoc is um, there were some downsides of VMA and, um, and we weren't comfortable with the licensing of Open Onload and it's, and it's quite difficult to add extra hardware to it as well. So we, we, we developed Exasoc, which is currently GPL. Um, we don't have any particular issues with, um, with you licensing it, but um, it's just, it was just the easiest. I've got the most familiarity with GPL projects, um, and it works nicely with the kernel, so it's, it's currently GPL. Um, one per network card vendor, really. I, I mean, it's, it's a bit excessive to have one per network card vendor. Um, I'll talk a little bit in a moment about um, how maybe we could improve that situation. Uh, all of these are, are used in various applications in, in industry. There's sort of two main approaches that, that are used in these stacks. Um, one is the user space only design where there's no, no kernel components. Basically, in order to do TCP uh, transparently, usually what happens is this LD preload library creates additional threads to handle all the TCP background work. Um, so the nice thing is that there's no kernel code. The, Ugly thing is that you're you're creating extra threads that uh, the original programmer of the application was not really aware of. So you can have unexpected side effects of that. So, for instance, if the user is setting a scheduling affinity, um, then suddenly you've got these extra threads spawn that don't have that inherit that affinity, and um, things may not work as expected. Um, Scheduling, you, you don't, you might not have expected to have extra threads around again. Uh, signal handling, p thread signal semantics. Now you have to deal with all that sort of stuff with having extra threads in your um, in your process that you didn't design your original process for. Um, basically, all this stuff that I'm uh, talking about here in these uh, slides is this transparent sort of mode. You can, of course, write a TCP stack in a library that the user's aware of, and so they write to some sort of API where the, the users provide the timers. But for the transparent acceleration, um, you're basically creating extra threads that the user's not, uh, that the programmer wasn't aware of, and so that can have side effects. Um, other problems with this sort of user space only design is that if you send something um, in fact, in, in VMA, even it doesn't even handle SIG term, but if you, certainly if you send a SIG kill or something, the process just goes away. There's no TCP closing behavior that, that happens. So things don't happen very cleanly when you, uh, when you exit. Uh, you can have some excessive ARPs because uh, there's, there's, no, there's no global ARP through the kernel. Every process starts and, and sends ARPs. And also, because sockets here, the accelerated sockets aren't actually kernel objects, they just exist within the library that's hijacking the socket calls. You can't do stuff like um, transferring sockets through send message, and exec is ugly because you call exec, all that library state goes away, um, and you can't inherit the, the sockets there either. So that, that's sort of the downsides of that. It is, it is, like I say, there's advantages in that there's no kernel code required in a user space only 
uh, TCP library. The other approach, which is the approach used by Open Onload and um, our stuff, Exasoc, is where you have a user space bit and a kernel bit. So in this case, when you, when you create a socket, so originally it's a socket, when, when the library enables acceleration on that socket, it creates a kernel object to back that, which is, uh, I mean, basically it's a handle to dev Exasoc in our implementation. Um, Similar in open onload, it's a, it's a handle to that a dev character device. Um, and then that socket, so you still have a real file descriptor that's backed by a kernel object. Um, but instead of being a socket, where, where a socket would go into the kernel TCP stack, it's the file descriptor to, um, to, that, to that character device. And basically what the user space library does is when, when it sees one of these, um, it it M maps that file descriptor to get direct access to the underlying uh, TCP state. So things like the TCP sequence number, acknowledgement number, et cetera, are in, in that kernel object in a sense, and the user, and user space maps them um, as required. And so then the user space can, when it needs to send a packet, it uh, pulls those sequence numbers, acknowledgement numbers, et cetera, out of that shared memory and does the send through the low latency um, direct mapped path. And the kernel driver handles the background work, which would otherwise probably require separate threads. So things like TCP timers, uh, retransmits, cleaning up sockets when a, um, when a process is killed, et cetera. And then ARP can be handled through the normal kernel tables. So, so the driver initiates ARPs when required and it, it listens on neighbor table events and lets user space know through the shared memory when user space needs to update its copy of that. So this is more complicated in that there's a kernel component, there's basically half a TCP stack in, in that kernel driver, um, but it works a little bit more nicely in that accelerated sockets are actually kernel objects now, and so you can do things like fork and exec and, and things work properly across um, across those. Now, this issue with having one of these stacks per network card vendor, which is not ideal, a couple of them are proprietary, a few of them are open source. Ideally, you'd have one stack that, sp uh, that supports multiple network cards. So theoretically, VMA from Mellanox, um, the back end is InfiniBand verb, so it could support other network cards. But, of course, not, a, not all Ethernet NICs, um, only, only a small subset of them support the InfiniBand verbs, um, RDMA stuff. And also, the VMA stack itself isn't the fastest performing one. Um, it's basically using LWIP, and for those of you uh, who've used LWIP before, it's, it's a stack that's designed for embedded applications. It's not a high-performance TCP stack. What's it stand for, sorry? Uh, LWIP? It Lightweight IP. Yeah, it, it's, it's basically a standard uh, TCP IP stack you can download, um, and it's mainly used for embedded type applications. Uh, Mellanox has take, or indeed it's Voltaire pre-Mellanox, um, they took it and incorporated it into this user space uh, code. It's, it works, but it's not as fast as, as some other stacks, so, so that, that's a downside um, to using that. Uh, open onload, is, is good, um, I'll, I'll say that honestly, it's a good, good stack, but it's a very large bit of code, it's difficult to add new network cards to it, and there's licensing issues as I talked about before, it's, it's not a very nice license. And wire and direct and DBL, the other two I talked about, um, are, are proprietary closed source, so I don't really know much about them, but we obviously can't add our network card to that. So, so when, we, when we developed our network card, we created Exasoc because we couldn't find anything else that could easily be leveraged. We, uh, it was sort of, it was not really a not invented here thing, it was more that, you know, we would have happily taken someone else's TCP stack, but it was something that we couldn't find off the shelf um, because of these issues. So, so Exasoc itself, um, fairly early in its life cycle stage, as, as happens, 
with these sort of systems. You start off with something that's small and fast, and then it gets bigger. Um, where we're at the small, fast stage. Um, so there's a, there's a danger that as you get feature creep, things get slower. And this, this is sort of generally applicable to any project. So um, one of the things that, that we're very keen on is to try and prevent that sort of performance creep by um, making things compile time configurable. Uh, so if you really want a lean build, you can get a fast lean build. Um, and if you want the features, you can enable the features. In theory, Exasoc um, could, could have additional hardware backends. Uh, we, we don't have any issues with that. Um, we, we haven't looked at yet adding any other backends other than our own hardware, but um, one idea that I had was to, to backend it onto DPDK so that all the so basically, uh, DPDK, um, for those who don't know, it's an Intel um, thing originally. It's um, device, sorry, uh, what's it stand for? Data Plane Development Kit. Yep, thank you. Um, and it's basically a framework to map network cards into user space and move packets around. Um, and so basically, you could use that. So DPDK, DPDK itself doesn't provide things like TCP stacks. Um, there are TCP stacks written on top of DD, DPDK, but they're not transparent in the same way as something like Exasoc. Um, so one idea would be to use Exasoc as a TCP stack and then uh, back it onto DPDK as to move packets, and then you would inherit the network cards that DPDK supports. So that, that's one idea. Um, uh, also, choosing a better name might be a good idea. So Exasoc, uh, that's sort of the unofficial logo in the right-hand side. It's a, it's, a, it's a sock. I drew that for another presentation, and then, uh, and then it got canned because it wasn't professional enough. But uh, basically, the idea is that it's a... So it's, it's a sock in that it intercepts socket calls, uh, and, and it's a sock in that it wraps your, wraps your application. So um, that's where Exasoc came from. If we, if we add other network cards uh, to it, then maybe we'll, you know, we'll drop the Exa from the name, Exa from Exablaze. Um, so, so then it could be something, uh, something else. Obviously, uh, Open Onload would be, is a nice name, but it's not as open as, as the Open Onload suggests, unfortunately. So, future stuff that, that we'd like to do. Um, so, obviously, our Exanic drivers for our network cards, we'd, we'd like to upstream that into the kernel. That's relatively easy because there's lots of network card drives in the kernel. It's a, it's a well-trodden path. Um, maybe needs a bit of cleanup, but, um, but they're actually fairly well-designed. Uh, the, the more difficult part is, is the Exasoc type stuff. Um, so, you know, I just, I just wanted to to give you guys an idea of, of what we're doing. Um, I, you know, there might be some resistance to putting half a TCP stack in something masquerading as a driver, um, but there, there's, some, uh, there's some cool use cases that uh, this enables. There, there's, some, there's some work we're still working on to clean up both the Exonic and Exasoc drivers before we upstream those, but they are, they are GPL. Um, so that's, our website, our GitHub account has has all this stuff that I that I was talking about. Um, I also added some links to uh, the competing stuff: Mellanox, VMA, and and SolarFlare Open Onload. So I'll open up for questions, Rotten Tomatoes, etc. stack of user space, can you take advantage of things like DMA to the card, or do you have to work around that somehow? Yeah, that, that, that's right. So, uh, so we do, um, so we do, uh, DMA is done directly from user space, and the way that works is basically, and it depends on what sort of, what sort of network card you're using. For our, for our network cards, the register interface to the device is basically designed so that you can do that. So the packet data is written to a PCI memory region, and that is mapped straight into user space. Um, so for, for the transmit, you write into the PCI memory region, and then the card sends it. For receive, um, the, the kernel on behalf of the user allocates, uh, say, a two megabyte ring buffer, 
and that data gets written into the ring buffer. So if, from, a, from a DMA point of view, the user gets the data directly. Um, the kernel takes care of, the kernel driver takes care of setting up those mappings for the, on behalf of the user. Uh, for other cards, there's other techniques, but basically it's a similar sort of idea in that there's some, there's some slow kernel call to set it up where you, where you might mmap the driver and the driver allocates the memory on your behalf, um, and then later on the data arrives directly. Um, if you're doing um, TCP packet assembly in user space, what stops a malicious user wreaking havoc by creating all sorts of interesting TCP packets or maybe ARP packets or God knows what? So, I mean, that's, that's really a problem with any stack. If it's, if it's in the kernel, you can have even more havoc, do you mean? Yeah, the thing is that the kernel will stop you. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't um, oh, you know, I, broadcast I, I, to some wacky... Okay, I, I, see, uh, I see what you're asking. So the you're saying uh, what's, what's stopping the user from wreaking havoc on the network by sending... Yeah, so, so basically... Uh, in order to, if you, if you want to allow the user to send these sort of by, uh, bypass frames, then they need to have some trust that they're not going to wreak havoc on your network. So in the same way as, you know, in, in Linux, you might have some capability for CapNet RAW or, or whatever. Um, in, this, in this case, so for instance, for our software, they need um, access to dev XNX0. Um, so... So you would, you would prevent them from opening that if they're not a trusted user. If you're transmitting by writing direct to the hardware ring buffer, how does the kernel handle retransmits? So uh, that, that's, that's an interesting question. So after writing to the hardware buffering, at least in our, our stack, we then do a kernel call, um, which is off the critical path. Um, actually, no, we, sorry, we don't do a kernel call. We, we put it in the shared memory region, so we, we copy a copy of the data into the shared memory region, so the data has a copy for the retransmit buffer. Yeah. Can you talk briefly about choice um, advantages and disadvantages you've faced implementing your own stack as to using one of those things that librarizes the kernel or something like that? Yeah, um, so we, we looked at both options. There are sort of some, um, so, so there's, there's a range of different options. There's like ones that libraryize the whole kernel. There's ones that um, are basically the BSD stack pulled out and into a library. Um, so we previously we had a um, because Exablaze came out of a trading company um, called Zamojo. We developed our own stack at Zamojo so we could do tricky stuff with TCP packets and stuff like that. And so we already had that infrastructure there. So when, when, when we looked at it, um, it, was, it was a matter of what we already knew versus biting off um, a big chunk of, of code. Now, obviously, the downside of that is yet another TCP stack. Are you fully RFC compliant with all the, uh, with all the RFCs? The upside is that it's small, easy to understand, um, it, uh, at least for us because we wrote it, but uh, it's, it is generally small and easy to understand. And for that reason, it's also faster. Like if we, were to, if we were to take the BSD stack, then fundamentally it would take, you know, a microsecond or two to get through that uh, TCP output path. Whereas in our stuff, um, we're, for the fast path, we're down to 150 nanoseconds or so. so because it's small and light, we've basically optimized it from the, from the ground up. So th there's benefits uh, to, to both approaches, but for us, because we wanted something fast, we write it from scratch. This is a very open-ended question, so take it as you will, but I'm just curious, in relation to DPDK, why you didn't leverage that, or maybe why you would now look to leverage it? I mean, there's political and latency and everything. I'm just curious, anything you have to yep. share on that from? Yep. Um, so. I think if we were doing it now, we would consider using DPDK. Um, when, we, when we started out, DPD, DPDK wasn't really on our radar because um, when I show you that list of vendors, um, 
none of those vendors use DPDK. Intel is quite big on DPDK. There's some other vendors that do DPDK, but in the low latency stuff, um, people don't really use it. Uh, but DPDK, I think, is used more in the sort of bandwidth acceleration type stuff than the latency acceleration type stuff. Um, I think in order, in terms of getting a wide variety of hardware support, I think DPDK would be really useful though. So, um, so it's something that could be leveraged in order to, to get more hardware support. Um, so, the, the, the six microsecond measurement you did earlier, was, uh, was that with uh, the low latency options turned on, or was that just as, as, as standard? I don't think it was. I asked, uh, so, I was traveling last week, I asked a colleague to do that measurement. I think it was just uh, with, uh, with a sort of def config type kernel. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly what was turned on, probably not with the low latency options. There may, there may be some advantages, but like, like my asterisk said, you may be able to get a bit better, um, but ultimately the, the stack has a fair bit of code in it, and so, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think that's, um, we've, we've hit time, so thank you, Matthew. Thank you.